Okay, well, thank you very, very much, everyone, for joining this evening. It's an absolute pleasure to, to give this this, um, this Q&A session. I believe it's our seventh to date. Um, the recordings of all of them are on both the community pages and on bound200.com forward slash info. So if, if you missed previous ones, um, please by all means do have a, have a little look on the website or the community pages. They're all up there and Tom will be too. It takes a, a week or so to, to edit it. So just bear with us, but we'll put the recording of this one up as well. So if you miss anything or want to watch it, uh, it'll, it'll all be online on on um, on the website and also the Darwin 200 YouTube channel. Well, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome everyone again tonight. My name is Stuart McPherson. Uh, I'm speaking from the Darwin 200 side and we have the wonderful Gabin, Matthias and Elvira also from the beautiful Elsterskillis side as well. So I'll hand over to, to the three of you for introductions your side as well. Perfect. Well, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, but I think also a few new ones. So sorry for everyone that already know about me, but I work in the office of the Oosterschelde together with Gerben and Matthias and um, have been working there for uh, 11 years. And I look forward to meeting you guys uh, by email or on the phone or during one of these meetings. And uh, I hope you have a lot of questions for us. <laughs> Right. Matthias? Sorry, Matthias. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, Elvira already explained. Uh, I'm also working uh, in the office. Um, well, the, the newest member of the team, I'm working there for a year now. But uh, for my entire life, I've been involved uh, in the, well, in the shipping company. As uh, well as Gerben is my uh, father. So it's, uh, well, we're turning it into a family business. And it's really exciting to uh, to work on, uh, on uh, well, preparing for the Darwin 200 Global Voyage. So uh, I think that's a good lead in for, uh, for Gerben to continue. Okay. Um, I don't know, am I muted or not? No, we not. can hear you. Oh, okay, uh, okay, I thought that was. Uh, so I'm his father and he thinks it's, uh, we're turning this into a family business, uh, but he's wrong. No, no, <laughs> I'm uh, Gerben, I'm uh, one of the captains of the Oosterschelde. I'm also the general manager of the company. And uh, actually, um, I'm the one um, that uh, that makes every year a a plan for the ship. Uh, the Oosterschelde is a historic uh, sailing vessel, and our first goal is to preserve a historic sailing vessel because there's very very few of them in the best way for the for the future for 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 generations. I hope after us, um, we do so by. Um, by sailing that ship, because our um, our philosophy is that if you put a ship aside, if you put her on the shore, if you put her in a port and have her only visited by people, she's not really alive and she will eventually um, um, go down. Eventually, the maintenance of a, of a ship in a, in a port, uh, the maintenance of a ship is, is, is only to be done by sailors. So what we do with a historic ship is uh, sailing her. And um, we try to do that in, in, in the best possible way, um, finding as many people that, uh, as possible that, that like her, that like the voyages we make, and um, that, uh, that uh, by, by being a passenger or a guest uh, on one of our voyages, uh, let's say contribute to the um, uh, preservation of that ship for, for the continuation of, that, uh, of our shipping company. Um, so that's my um, job. Um, I'm also a captain. I met uh, uh, Stu, I think, one and a half year ago. Stu, we yes. were in contact. Uh, we came in contact with each other uh, uh, by a mutual, uh, let's say, a friend or acquaintance. And uh, Stu told me about his plans that he has been working on for many, many years. And um, I was telling about my ship and uh, we shook hands. Uh, basically, that's it, uh, Stu. Yes, so, much, yes. Um, And the rest is history, as they say. Uh, we are now in the in the in the well in the in the stadium of 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 um, finalizing many many things in the in this big project. You must understand that a project like this is is not. I mean, you can write down the plan. Uh, in, in, in weeks or in, in days, perhaps, if you know it, but to, to work it out, it, it costs a lot of time. So um, the past one year, past one and a half year, 
Uh, we have been uh, working on the plan uh, next to our other projects. We have been um, trying to, um, to find out what was the, the best route, what was the best days, how many days it took. We, are, we made an itinerary and we try to make a description of each leg that we want to uh, sail. Um, this, uh, these uh, descriptions uh, are now on the, the internet of, uh, of, of uh, the website of the Oosterschelde. You can see every leg and you can read on every, let's say, um, uh, um, leg what, what, what are the topics, what is interesting about them. Um, we use these question and answer sessions to to have you uh, ask additional questions. If you uh, find uh, there is a lack of information, if you find uh, you want to know, know more about other things, then uh, me and Stu and Matthias and Elvira are there to answer those questions. Um, and next to that, uh, we can also uh, update you on every session on uh, where we are. So, um, well, that's my uh, conversations to uh, now for you. Well, thank you so, so much uh, for that, Kevin. Um, and it, as I say, it's just an honor to work together and it's a great pleasure to meet everybody on, on, involved in the voyage, uh, taking part as participants. Um, well, for this evening, if everyone, everyone is happy, we have, um, I'm gonna give a quick five minute presentation over the, uh, of an overview of the, the Darwin 200 project, just so everyone can have a high level overview of, of the project and why we're doing this and what, what it seeks to achieve. Then I'm going to hand back over to Gerben. I believe Gerben's um, very kindly going to speak concerning the the, uh, the current maintenance of the ship and the, the some exciting news from the vessel itself. Then I prepared the last of four presentations that provide an overview of each and every one of the voyage legs. Tonight we have 25 to 32, which is some of the most amazing legs of all. As you may have read from recent mail outs and posts on, on social media, where we're we're over 75% capacity now, so there's only a few places left. So if you haven't booked a place yet, um, please, please do so. The, the, the legs are nearly full. We're going to be sending out a list of those legs available this week um, that remain. So um, have a good old listen to legs 25 and 32 and see if any, any of which are of interest to you and, and join before they're all, all are gone. And then last, we'll hand over to the floor for questions and answers. So this is your chance, your opportunity to put forward any questions whatsoever concerning the voyage, the ship, the project, um, or anything in general. So, um, so we'll 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 start with that if that's okay. All righty. So, Elvira, if it's okay, if you'd be so kind as to pass over, um, I'll share my screen and then I can do the presentation concerning the project. Yes, I Thank think you. you can yeah. uh, share it. Yep, absolutely perfect. Thank you. Always a little bit worrying when you when you care uh, that it comes through okay but yeah that's great <laughs> okay well thank you again everyone for attending um in five minutes i'm going to give an overview of the project and what we're setting out to do um and why it matters so um the Darwin 200 project has been the culmination of literally 10 years of work and development and two test voyages that we've undertaken last year and the year before um, the project has three key goals um, the, goal, the first goal is to empower, train, and inspire the world's the very best elite conservationists, one from each of 200 countries and states around the world. We're literally launching a new site this week, um, or rather we're updating our site this week and launching some new functionality. We've already begun the selection process of these incredible young people, particularly in partnership with Roots and Shoots, which is Jane Goodall, with the Jane Goodall Institute. So you can, you can see that on the site this week. I'll talk more about these young people in a second, but that's the first objective. The second is to create the world's most exciting classroom and engage millions and millions of students right the way around the world with weekly events every single week, nonstop around the world, bringing in conservationists, activities, competitions, research projects from different corners of the globe, from particularly obviously from the locations that we'll be visiting as we journey around the world as part of this voyage. It is entirely free, it costs nothing, and um, the idea is to engage schools across the planet. And last but not least, some really, really exciting research projects that we're undertaking with some amazing partners. Um, we're absolutely honored to say that we have three of the world's top conservationists as part of this, this project. Um, the amazing Dr. Jane Goodall, who I'm sure you all know, 
um, from her, her inspirational work with chimpanzees, but equally, um, she has the Jengal Institute, which works in 65 countries right the way around the globe. And um, we're selecting uh, elite conservationists from her network um, in those countries right now. The equally amazing and inspiring Dr. Sylvia Earle, um, basically one of the top marine biologists and marine conservationists alive today, whose, whose work stretches back seven, seven decades right the way back and has a particular affinity with the Galapagos. So it's a great, great honor to be working with, with, um, with Sylvia. And last but not least, uh, another person with a bit of a connection to the Galapagos, um, Dr. Sarah Darwin, who is the great, great granddaughter of Charles Darwin um, and an amazing um, biologist and, and ecologist in her own right as well, that's undertaken some inspiring work as well. So you may have seen from, from the Dutch Toolship website and the Darwin 200 website, um, as Gerben was very kindly saying earlier, we've, sit, we've, we've planned out this incredible voyage around the world, which we want you to be part of. Um, we have simplified Charles Darwin's journey on HMS Beagle. What, what we've actually done, because the Beagle's voyage was five years, we've, we've obviously had to compress it into two. Um, the Beagle actually backtracked back and forward along the coast of South America. So there was obviously no point doing that. So we, we, we're going down the coast of South America once on the East Coast and the West Coast, rather than multiple times. And we've added in some additional locations which Darwin did not visit. For example, he did not visit Easter Island or, or, um, or Rarotonga or Fiji. We've added those in just because they're such incredible places and to break up the long sea passages to make the, the journey more, more, um, more interesting and, and even more exciting than it already is. We've also um, made one significant adjustment, whereas um, Darwin did cross the Indian Ocean, but only stopped very, very briefly in Cocos Keeling and Mauritius. Well, we've made an adjustment because of the seasonality and the conditions and the weather, it, it, it made more sense to go underneath South America, um, past Cape Horn um, to Stanley and actually return back across the Southern Ocean and the South Atlantic. So other than that, though, it's very faithful to Darwin's journey. And we, we, we land at every single major port which, where Charles Darwin made landfall. And so we basically, we see everything that he saw uh, and more in those additional locations. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, it's simply the greatest natural history story and adventure of all time. The locations along this, this voyage itinerary include some of the most extraordinary places on the planet, from South Georgia to the Clapgus, obviously, to, but also some very special, less well-known ones that we're going to be talking about in legs 25 and 30 today, um, particularly at the Atlantic Islands, Tristan de Cunha, Ascension, and St. Helena, which Personally, I think are some of the most amazing places on earth. Um, so if you choose to come, um, in addition to a world beating experience on this incredibly important historic tour ship, both topping and tailing your experience sailing uh, on the Siskel Day, you've got the opportunity to see these incredible locations and the, the, the people, the plants, and the animals that they hold. So it's, it's hopefully a very special opportunity for people to join. Well, just very, very quickly, so I'll just elaborate a little bit further concerning the Darwin leaders um, and each of the three objectives. So in, in a nutshell, we have to say we're working with these different partners and we've already started this process to select these top young conservationists. These are not normal people. These are people that have done ex extraordinary things. We're selecting one from each of 200 countries and states around the world. There are approximately 18 to 25. The upper limit, we're pushing the upper limit a little bit more because we've had some incredible candidates that, that, um, that are just perfect for this. And we're bringing them in their formative years to the ports where Darwin made landfall. We're partnering them with, with incredible NGOs in those, those locations. And I'm personally going to every single port on the voyage itinerary over January, February, March, and April uh, to finalize these, 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 um, these placements with the NGOs. And we're partnering them with them to undertake a very focused, very clear package of activities. In a nutshell, they have to pick an animal or a plant Charles Darwin studied and undertake three objectives in partnership with that NGO with which they, um, they're partners. They have to look at, the, look at what's happened to that plant or animal species. And in every single case, there's been a negative trajectory. I can't think of a, a single example where that's not, that doesn't hold true. So basically got to look what's happened over the last 200 years 
and see how the population has changed. Work with the NGO to look at the conservation work that's being undertaken currently and document that, again, in a report and a film. Each of these objectives they have to do a report and a film for. And then last but not least, they have to really use their initiative. They have to really, really get out there, pull up their boots and work out ways in which they can make it better by interviewing the community, going studying, undertaking real research, real activities, again, under the guidance of the NGOs and the partners in, in the locations. Um, but those are their three key project activities. And the idea is that then they'll return back to their home countries and will have trained and empowered these elite young people. The intention is to create the decision makers in the world of tomorrow. So to create the next generation Jane Goodalls, the next generation Sylvia Earls, et cetera, et cetera. That they'll go back and be drivers for change over the next 50 years or more. Um, very, very quickly then, um, the, the world's most exciting classroom projects. If, you, if you've been following my work or, or know me from previous um, expeditions and so forth, and I, I recognize a few of the names, I know a few of you do. Um, the rest of my life has been concern, concerning creating resources for schools. We've sent out over 60,000 resource boxes to schools to date and, and a lot more coming over the next couple of years as well. And so we know this stuff works. What we're doing is creating a massive raft of totally free projects and activities for um, these, these young people right the way across the globe. That includes live experiments, essays, research activities, interviews, nature hour, lectures, daily documentaries, and so forth. And we've actually got 10 test examples of these coming up over the next three, few weeks, the first of which concerns South Georgia. So you, you're gonna hear more about that shortly. So if anyone is coming on leg 28, um, please, please join this session. Or if you're just interested in South Georgia, join anyway, and you'll see one of these, we're doing a hundred of these during the voyage. You'll see these test 10 taking place starting literally next week. Um, and from the previous, the, the test voyages, we did beamed live from, from the world's biggest Ghana colony here in Bass Rock to schools right across the globe. Um, last but not least, we've got a cit several citizen science projects coming together and we're having two marine biologists on each voyage leg right the way around the world. So I'm um, going to be undertaking some really exciting research projects concerning coral reef surveys, uh, habitat surveys, plastic, global plastic trawls, cetacean and seabird surveys, and um, we're also developing some pollution projects as well. And last but not least, the entire project will be double carbon positive. We've allocated in our budget funding to double over the carbon impact, the carbon footprint by replanting trees in the Atlantic rainforest, the rainforest which Charles Darwin visited on the coast of South America, but I think 93% or something like that has since been destroyed. So we'll actually be helping to to put back some of that forest that Darwin saw, but, but tragically has been lost. So very, very briefly, I think my last slide, um, what we have done today is undertake two test voyages to get the systems right and build our relationships with our funding partners, which have taken years and years to, 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 to build partnerships and relationships with. Um, we undertook a seven week concept voyage in, in 2020 and a 13 week um, voyage, particularly partnering, finalizing partnerships in, in 2021. And we're ready now to set sail on the, on the global voyage. So in exactly one year from now, we will, we, it will have begun. It begins next August on the 26th of August. So be well on the way around the world. So this is just shots of the test voyage that we undertook on Pelican of London with some of the young scientists. So it's an honor, a great honor to be working um, with, uh, with, with Geb and Elvira and Matthias. And we really all hope that you'll be part of this magnificent journey. So please, please sign up also on dutchtourship.com um, and be part of this unique adventure. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Gerben and you'll hear back from me shortly when we give an overview of the next 25 to 32. Thank you so much, Elvira, and I'll stop sharing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> There we go. Um, there we go. Let me see. Sure. Let me see. I um, would like to start with a, a little overview here of our um, website. 
as you see, the website is it's like a little pictures with some description of each leg. And if you click on the uh, more uh, info, uh, reserveren, this is Dutch one. But if you look at uh, dutchtollship.com, you can click any leg you want and read more about it. Um, meanwhile, uh, where we were, uh, um, where um, Stu is, is, let's say, investigating and and and. Um, uh, finalizing the the commitments of the NGOs and 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 the youngsters that will join us uh, on the various uh, spots that we will visit, um, I am working on the ship. Um, the ship is a historic ship. She's uh, built in 1917. She's more than 100 years old, as uh, you will uh, easily calculate, and that means she she needs a lot of uh, care. Um, this upcoming uh, around the world trip uh, actually made me decide to do some extra. Uh, we have a, a very thorough uh, maintenance schedule anyway. So um, this year we were about to take off the complete rigging to have that maintained. Uh, I mean, it's 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 checked and, and uh, actually certified every year. It's maintained uh, every day. But uh, every five years, you 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 do something what they call a main survey on her, and we take off uh, the whole rigging and and the mast, and I take her in. So that uh, was what that what we are doing at uh, this moment. Here you see uh, Oosterschelde. Um, she's here in the, in the, in a port uh, somewhere in the north of the Netherlands, and uh, we have already taken off the the booms, the gaffs, the top mast, the yards. Uh, all these spars, but now we are actually here hoisting off one of the main masts. This is the mizzen mast coming off the ship, and we are uh, actually uh, putting that into a huge uh, shed. These masts, um, made of wood, they are um, um, by far the biggest wooden masts uh, uh, in the Netherlands, and I don't think that there are many masts uh, uh, from one piece bigger uh, anywhere in the world anyway. Uh, so we are taking them here in into a shed, and uh, my crew is uh, um, scraping them. We will uh, we we check them, we uh, sand them, we refarnish them, and if they need some special care, we give them that uh, special care. Here you get a little impression of how big one such a mast is. It's endless. It's endless. So we've been working on this uh, for the past uh, days and weeks. Um, meanwhile, the ship. Here you see the ship on the on the ship on the slip. Um, so she's taken on the dry, and as you see, there is a huge uh, um, hole in their side. Um, that's a quite a bit, uh, quite a sad story. Um, it's an historical ship, so we try to maintain her um, as good as as we can. But uh, in the old days, there was some concrete ballast. Um, Put in the ship. The concrete is meant as a, a label, ballast weight for the for to to improve the sailing, uh, let's say, cap capacity. And um, concrete is quite nice material. It fits in everywhere as uh, as long as it's a uh, sort of uh, uh, fluid. Um, it's quite heavy, and so it it gives. Uh, and once it's dry, it's it it sits uh, it it's stuck. So it's it's quite a safe and good uh, ballast system. But um, between the steel and the concrete, there is um, a part you, you, you can never reach anymore. And we have noticed that there was some, on some parts, the concrete came loose from the ships after decades. And in between the concrete and the, and the ship steel, you get a layer of rust, sometimes some moist. Um, and um, that is, let's say, deterioration that you cannot see, you cannot, um, paint, you cannot uh, do anything about it. So um, I decided to, uh, with this upcoming uh, um, um, <clears throat> um, uh, big voyage ahead of us, to um, um, to take this concrete out. And the only way of doing that is, is cutting a hole in the ship, as you see it here. Um, we're well on the way. You see here the hole a little bit... Uh, uh, bigger and uh, if you look very well then then you see here you see this concrete uh, uh, sitting in the in the in the bottom of the ship um, in the bilges of the ship and here is a, a picture taken uh, actually today when I was on the shipyard where we are actually reinstalling new frames here uh, and after that we will uh, put in 
uh, back in the the hull plating. So we are well on the way. It's a, it's a big big project. It it looks quite sad and actually it makes me quite sad. But we all do that uh, to have a, a a good and sound and safe ship again uh, um, within a few weeks time because that's how quick it goes. And um, then we'll uh, put back on all the spars, on all the rigging, all the sails that are now at the sail makers. And we're ready to go uh, in the beginning of uh, December to sail again. Um, after December, actually, um, we leave uh, for a, uh, a voyage to Cape Verde. We'll be sailing around in Cape Verde, around the Cape Verde Islands uh, for a few months and then come back to uh, Europe um, to, to do some other uh, sailing trips. And then uh, by August, we hope uh, that everything is settled and that uh, and that we'll be in Plymouth to uh, to take off for this uh, uh, fantastic uh, round the world uh, voyage, this global voyage that we are uh, planning now. So this is a very short uh, interview or, or how you say not interview uh, overview of the uh, the works that we are doing uh, currently. Okay. Ah. Thank you, Gerben. Um, I will uh, see if I can. It is a nice photo just to keep like this, right? Yes. But I have a few questions that I cannot see now. <laughs> um, well, we have uh, one question or a few questions from Annika. Thank you. Uh, it's the first one is for Stuart. I'm yes. a teacher in upper grade of a primary school in the Netherlands. And we'll be participating in the lek from the Falklands to Strait uh, of Magellan. I missed the first part of the session of today, but I would like to know if there will be a possibility to interact in any way during the voyage. Absolutely, definitely. That's the whole point. So definitely, definitely interaction. Please, please attend the event on October the 7th at 2 p.m. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an overview of it when, when we're doing the, the presentation about the legs. But yes, the entire point of this is to engage with students and schools around the world. We'll be doing competitions, act activities, er, er, doing 100, 100 events, one a week for two years. So definitely we'll be in interacting. Um, we're, we're actually, you're, if you join the event on the, the 7th, you'll see it in miniature. So the events, the 10 of these that we, we've now prepared over the next six months, these are in miniature. These are small versions we've got. Um, 3,000 pounds, British pounds in competition prizes that we're giving away. Um, we've got three activities during the event. We've got conservationists from South Georgia beaming in. Um, we've got lots of different projects happening on the 7th. So to be clear, yes, definitely. Throughout the entire voyage, we're going to be running activities, experiments, projects on a weekly basis that we want students at schools right the way around the globe to take part in. So please join on the 7th and you'll see this in miniature. It's only a prototype what we're doing, um, these 10 test events. But yes, you'll, you'll see that. Um, I also see another question, I think, really aimed at me, concerning um, uh, the trips, the land-based trips. But we're very pleased to say that next Q&A session is dedicated entirely to these. So we, we've got four planned, Ascension, St. Helena, um, uh, and, um, and the Falkland Islands, as well as the Azores as well. Um, if you can just hold on till next next session, next Q and A session, we'll have the full itineraries ready for you for those. It basically, if anyone hasn't heard of these and wants to know what they are, um, particularly for for more remote locations, more remote islands that are difficult to organise things in, like the Falkland Islands, like Ascension, like Saint Helena, and so forth, we've um, we've actually organised a, a plan, a, a week plan in each of these locations to help those taking part on the legs that start and end in those destinations um, to take to, to see some of the highlights. So for example, those that are joining the leg nine, which goes, which arrives into Stanley in the Falkland, and those that, that, that leave on leg 10, the joining where it joins, in the middle in the Falklands, we've got a week planned, um, like a, a tour around the Falkland Islands to see you know, five species of penguins, um, the world's largest albatross colonies, um, uh, many of the historic sites and so forth, and some incredible um, seabird locations uh, as well, the prions and the cobs are in and all and so forth. So these have been quite a lot of work pulling together. I've been working on the attention of St. Helena and Falkland um, itineraries, 
But if you can just hold on a little bit longer, we'll have them all ready. They'll be on the community pages ahead of the next month session, which is on the 1st of November, like always. Um, so, um, so I hope that helps answer your, your question there, Annika. I think so. I was a bit quick already with the questions because I uh, uh, forgot a little bit that you still <laughs> are going <laughs> to explain more about the legs. Maybe that's now a good moment. I'm not sure. Sure. That's, <laughs> that's all right. Okay. All righty. I'll, um, I'll share my screen then for the presentation concerning the legs. So, um, all right, here we go. I'll just close all those. So, has watched the previous um oh sorry can you see my, my okay no oh. i can't oh. see it but maybe it's, it's my it's internet bad. connection no i can't see it either. okay i might have to over i might just have to leave and enjoy sure no. Maybe in the meantime, I'm not sure if Gerben is there. There's a question about maintenance by Jake and Shanna. What kind of maintenance should we expect to do on the vessel during the legs? Well, all the um, the big maintenance is done uh, before or after you're joining on board, uh, except, of course, if something breaks or if something happens, then we have to repair that. But we don't uh, necessarily expect people to, to, uh, to help with that. If they have skills, if they want to, of course they can. Um, during the most of the voyages, uh, most of the voyage legs, the maintenance will be only the small maintenance. You can't uh, actually varnish anything when you're at full uh, sea. You can't paint anything on the outside of your ship, and you can't uh, put her on the dry, obviously, when you're in the ocean. So the the the, the maintenance uh, underway is always the the smaller maintenance, like. Uh, uh, things that that uh, well whatever bulbs that are need to be replaced or or uh, um, an engine that needs to have let's say an oil uh, um, how you say change or uh, filters to be changed things like that that's the the usual maintenance uh, uh, at sea uh, sometimes we have a, a sail that needs some care and we take it off we change it with a spare sail and then we can sew it uh, and that's quite time consuming so that's something. We, we like to teach to, to our guests on board and then we can uh, do that. But um, normally the, the, the maintenance is, uh, is smaller on board during these legs. <clears throat> Thank you. Stuart, can we try again? I'm so sorry. It's my guest fear realized um, when you <laughs> share the screen, then it, then it crashes. My Zoom crashed. I'm so sorry. Right, let's try again. And hopefully this time it plays ball. Can you see that okay? Yes. Yes, Excellent. it's okay. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay, so in our last session, we ended in on leg twenty-four in um, in Sydney, in Australia. So today we pick up the story back on, starting with leg twenty-five. So actually, this entire section here in orange, um, which is the return journey back back um, to to Europe from Australia. So um, you may recall. Um, Leg 25 starts um, on November the 26th, um, and it's to journey down to Tasmania, to Hobart. Um, it's, it's just over, well, just over, what, well, just over a week or so. And um, as you may be aware, this is a very famous sea journey in Australia, the, the Sydney to Hobart race. So you can recreate it, obviously not at the same time as the famous race, but still you can recreate that journey in some of the best conditions in the summer. Um, and um, I think this is a, a photo of a previous a previous part of that journey on, on one of the previous club voyages. Um, Hobart, if you haven't been, it, it's an absolute gem of a little town sitting under Mount Wellington. This is a really exciting leg, starting in Sydney, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and getting down to Hobart. And obviously with the geography of Tasmania, you've got to pass quite a lot of coastline before getting to Hobart. So it's, it's going to be a really fun leg and a really interesting leg with some incredible scenery and a great destination. Uh, when you finally, finally reach land and, and touch base and can explore. And um, although the voyage legs are really about the, uh, the experience on Osiskel de sailing um, between these ports, don't forget when you get there, of course, there's, that you have the opportunity then to explore 
the amazing sights from that each port has to offer and, and Tasmania is particularly famous for its wildlife it's unbelievable how easy it's to see echidnas I've gone down there three or four times already um from Sydney and, and yeah you can see it really easily I've never seen a Tassie devil in the wild but um but uh, friends of mine have and of course wombats so um hopefully you have a great time in, in Tasmania the next leg is a, another really exciting one um doing the crossing across the Tasman Sea um home to albatrosses and some amazing wildlife as well, leaving Tasmania and, and heading over to Christchurch. Again, Charles Darwin did not do this, um, but this is the point in the journey where we diverge from him. Um, the Beagle did reach, reach Tasmania, of course, but that, from this point onwards, yeah, we diverge from the Beagle journey uh, temporarily. These waters, of course, are, are famous and it's a, a bit of a, um, a, trial of, a, a trial of rights in Australia. It's a very famous thing to do to cross the Tasman Sea and reach beautiful New Zealand. And of course, then you'll be perfectly placed to explore the South Island as well. Um, famed for seals, fur seals and sea lions um, and, and several species of, of unique penguins uh, as well. I think these are royal penguins. Um, and of course, yeah, exploring the South Island. Next leg is definitely one for um, those that don't have a faint heart. This is the most hardcore leg of the entire voyage and really, really is advisable only for those that, that, are, that, are, that have got serious experience and really, really determined to, to, to bag the horn. Um, as I'm sure as you know, going around Cape Horn was a, a trophy for mariners for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, I believe it was Sir Francis Drake that, I believe it was certainly one of the first, if not the first to, to, to go around the Cape. Magellan went through the Straits, of course, but, but Drake went through right under the Cape Horn, and hence it's called, yeah, uh, the Great Passage named after him. This is a, is, a, is a wild experience for those that want a really amazing sailing adventure. And of course, there's no ship in the world better, more, more amazing stood on than Osterskelde. Um, this, this, this is the longest leg, also by far the longest leg of the entire voyage. As you can see from the dates, it's, it's over seven weeks in duration. Um, and um, crossing some of the roughest waters on the planet. So this is a serious leg and a sailing, serious sailing experience. But for those that, that want to absolutely hone their sailing skills and be some of the most amazing waters in the world, Cape Horn, yeah, is hard to, to beat. I, I believe it's true to say that the Horners, as they were known, used to be able to wear a gold ring um, and they earned several privilege, privileges, um, certainly in the Royal Navy, they could put their feet up on the table in the mess when messing. And, um, and there were several other privileges that they, they could get because they achieved the honor of going around Cape Horn. So it's quite an accomplishment for sailors past and present to, to do this. Um, and I, I believe this is a photo that, that I think Gavin very kindly put in of, of, of a previous voyage of, of us just doing precisely this, um, notice the white water. <laughs> Again, definitely don't do this if you've never sailed before. Um, for those that could just imagine that sense of achievement, reaching Stanley in the Falkland Islands after undertaking this epic, epic sea journey around Cape Horn all the way from Christchurch. Well, that then gets us into position for the next leg, leg 28. And so I know we mentioned it a couple of times before earlier on this call, but just while we're on it, and so I don't forget um, after talking about this leg, on September the sorry on October the seventh at two p.m. UK time, so that's um, that's uh, that's three p.m. Holland Dutch time, and I believe nine a.m. Eastern USA time. We have this test event, the first of ten, um, concerning South Georgia, and it's particularly relevant to this leg for those that that have joined, and I think we have one or possibly two places left. Those that still want to join, um, South Georgia is simply one of the greatest concentrations of wildlife, certainly sub-Antarctic wildlife on Earth. I mean, the numbers are staggering. It's got 35 million seabirds, um, I think 22 of which are Antarctic primes alone, and um, over 500,000 pairs of, of king penguins, 4 million fur seals, a couple of hundred thousand elephant seals. It's just unbelievable. So those that are coming on this leg will see South Georgia. We've budgeted in a couple of, a few days um, to explore some of the key sites, again, weather permitting, of course. Um, but yeah, if you're coming on this leg, I strongly recommend joining 
for for this presentation on on October the seventh. The event, the times, the joining link is in the community pages online. So this this leg crosses obviously the Southern Ocean, the South Atlantic, going from the Falkland Islands to South Georgia to Tristan da Cunha, the most remote inhabited island in the world, and then Cape Town. You you can't really get um, context just from a map. So Tristan lies 3,200 kilometers from Cape Town and 2,800 kilometers from the coast of South America. Actually, I think this spot on this map isn't quite in exactly the right position, but anyway, um, I was very lucky to visit personally, both South Georgia and Tristan de Cunha filming a BBC series. And both of them are extraordinary for different reasons. Um, the Falkland Islands themselves are a gem of the place. And astonishingly, we've still got a couple of places available on um, leg 27 sailing to the Falklands and leg, um, I believe it's leg 11 going across to, to Stanley. So if, you, if you're if you still interested in, in looking for an amazing leg, I cannot recommend the Falkland Islands enough. It's got five species of penguins, um, the world's biggest albatross colonies. It's incredible. So this is when this leg 28 starts. Um, we we'll sail out from Stanley, um, past there's a big wreck called Lady Elizabeth, which hopefully won't be a bad omen. Um, this was, the Falklands was very famous as a place where lots of ships would be deliberately scuttled or sunk, or rather scuttled or sunk for their insurance money ac accidentally, and it would happen again and again and again. Unfortunately, the, this particular one, the Lady Elizabeth broke anchor and just drifted, but there's many, many, many wrecks um, there was the wreck of this incredible ship, SS Great Britain, one of um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's ships, um, the first steel hold ship, I believe, in the world, and the first with a, with a screw propeller as well. This isn't it, this is the Lady Elizabeth, but the, the SS Great Britain was, was brought up and brought back to Bristol and restored. Anyway, so from there, we head over to South Georgia. Um, and again, I, I believe it's four days have been scheduled, again, weather permitting, but into the great wildlife sites and the great historic sites of the island, from the whaling stations like Gritviken and Stromness, where hundreds of thousands of whales were caught over a 50 year period, to yeah, Salisbury Plain, where there's 200,000 king penguins which you can walk between. And again, if you join the event on October the 7th, you'll hear about that. Um, to the spectacular, I mean, all along South Georgia, it, it's the most picturesque place I've ever been. It's incredible. And all of the beaches are filled, particularly on the northern side of the island, which is where we'll be going, because it's, you know, that's the shelter side. And that's where the whaling stations are. Um, it's home to the just the best, best wildlife sites you can imagine, particularly penguins, particularly fur seals, and particularly elephant seals. And we're going at the very best time, really, as well, um, late in the season, where you'll, you'll see the chicks fledging. Um, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. And um, yeah, this is just a tiny part of the colony on Salisbury Plain. It's pretty amazing. Anything battling elephant seals as well. Uh, you can't get too close to them, but they can move surprisingly quickly when you get close. And cute little little fluffy fur seals, but the adults chase you down the beach and, and they can be a little bit boisterous, but the little one's very cute. And of course, the whaling stations. There are seven big stations along, along the northern coast of South Georgia. Uh, this is, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is Stromness or, or Stromness or Gold Harbour. Actually, I think it might be Gold Harbour. Anyway, it doesn't particularly matter. There's seven of them where up to 3,000 people worked during the summer seasons from, I think it was 1907 onwards to 19 and early 1960s. Um, and you can still go there today. This is Grip Vicken. And it's fascinating to go and explore this. And you can literally walk around the old whale tanks and they still drip whale oil to this day. They still contain whale oil. I filmed it. They still drip whale oil. It's unbelievable. Um, and then we leave the, the beautiful glacial landscape of South Georgia. The Tristan de Cunha, the most remote inhabited island on earth. The Tristanians have lived here since the early 19th century when Napoleon Bonaparte was exiled to St. Helena. A little garrison was built on Tristan. And today there's about, I think, 270, 280 uh, Tristanians. Um, I was very lucky to spend about two weeks on the island. It, it is extraordinary. Words can't describe it. You, you have to experience, experience it. It is notoriously 
difficult to land though. So again, it is all weather, weather providing, weather, you know, weather allowing. But the entire community lives on this little coastal plain on the left, um, where there's the little settlement called Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, which I think is such a beautiful name for it. And the Tristanians live a, a lifestyle, a very romantic lifestyle of farming and catching lobsters. Because it's a relatively young volcano, the waters around Tristan are species poor. There's relatively few crustaceans, but what there is is a type of rock lobster. Um, and because there aren't, there's no crabs and there's few other crustaceans, the rock lobsters are super abundant because they fill basically the entire ecological niche. And um, the island is totally self-sufficient economically. It, it's a UK overseas territory. It's funded um, for its defense and a few key elements like medical medicine and so forth. Um, but basically, yeah, it, it, the island is self-sufficient from farming, and catching lobsters. Um, and if, if you can land ashore, it, it's one of the most unique and fascinating places I've ever been in my life. It's so interesting that the people are very friendly and interesting. I actually, I went the wrong way deliberately. I went from Cape Town against the trade winds deliberately in a very small vessel. It was only, I think, 32 feet long or something like that. So nowhere near as luxurious or special as, as a Siskelia, but I did so deliberately for a film series. Um, and deliberately didn't shave to convey a concept of distance. And it, it took three weeks to reach the island. But again, we were going deliberately the wrong direction from Cape Town across to Tristan. Um, on our global voyage, we'll be going the sensible way um, from South Georgia up with the, the winds and the waters behind us. And these are the traditional houses of the Tristanians, made from volcanic stone um, and thatched. Um, and again, yeah, you'll be able to explore the island and see these unique tree fern forests, which it's famed for, um, and these these wonderful yellow nose black yellow nose um, yellow nosed albatrosses, which it's very special for. Oh, and there's lots of endemic life, including these goff moor hens and, and and lots more, and and beautiful waters uh, as well nearby. Then we continue the journey and finally reach the continent of Africa. So imagine what it would be like coming into Cape Town after those long passages at sea and seeing Table, Table Mountain um, and Table Bay rise above the clouds. And as you may know, mariners would look out for this unique mountain and the, 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 the clouds were called the, the tablecloth. It was known as the tablecloth coming off the mountain. So you might see that coming off as you come into, into Table Bay, um, and then birth obviously in, uh, in, in, in South Africa. So, and, and of course, South Africa's an amazing destination and a good place to to be in its own right, full of interesting wildlife and amazing history as well. Lake 29 uh, goes from Cape Town to St. Helena. And if anyone hasn't yet um, chosen a leg, I think this one and the next one, leg 30, are, are amazing. St. Helena and Ascension are just little jewels in the sea. They are such interesting places. Um, and this is a really interesting, really fun uh, journey. I, I, I did this sea passage myself but on a different ship called it was at the time the last working raw mail postal ship called the the rms saint helena but it's been scrapped since then saint helena if you don't know anything about it it's a little island um it's got about 300 inhabitants um it was actually settled about 400 years ago so it has a very long history going back and it, it's just the most interesting place it really is it's like a living museum Every single building, every single part of the island is stories. It's it's bristling with castles and fortifications. Um, it, it was originally Portuguese, then it became British. It was actually captured, I believe, by the Dutch and then became British again. It's had a very colourful history um, and was very strategically important as a victualling station. So ships going around the Cape Shore, really returning more, um, would call in here to resupply or repair hopefully we're not going to be needing to, to do much of that but anyway um it's a it's an incredible destination to, to reach and um yeah it it, it it's a it, the, the local people are called saints or saint hellenians but they're known as saints and um the waterfront is it really is like a, a walking a walking an open museum captain cook went there william bligh obviously charles darwin many many other key names in in maritime history landed here for that very reason for the victory. 
and the, the little town, Jamestown, is squeezed in this narrow valley because it's so narrow. Basically, nothing's changed. L literally, took it down in the center here. Every single building is 19th or 18th century. It's it's very very little change from when it when it was um, you know, from past centuries. Ecologically, it's a fascinating place to reach and a really interesting island in its own right. It's often called the Galapagos of the Atlantic because it has up to 500 um, species of, of bugs, of invertebrates that occur nowhere else in the world. It's about eight, the island is about 8 million years old. So it's a, a relative, it's an older island than others like Ascension. Um, so it has a lot of unique life. Um, it's also when Napoleon Bonaparte was was exiled and lots of these bugs are named after Napoleon, which he probably wouldn't have been that happy about. Um, it's got great wildlife, including mask boobies and sea buds. And the, the oldest living land animal alive today called Jonathan the tortoise. And you can go and see him if you want to, if you, if you go to this, this island. He lives at the, um, the administrator's residence, which is that white building in the back. And if I remember correctly, He's known to have been around since nine, since 1830. I think it might have even been earlier than that. He didn't quite see Napoleon. He arrived after Napoleon was would died on the island in 19, in 1821, I believe. But yeah, he's said to be the the oldest land animal alive today. Um, so what, nearly 200 years and it's 100 190s. And so you can go and see him and pet him as the the local kids uh, love to do. And last but not least, those that are interested in history, St. Helena is an amazing place where Napoleon Bonaparte was exiled and spent the last six years of his life and died in this very house called Longwood House. Lake 30 um, is, a, again, a fascinating place. I should just say, so you can fly to St. Helena and fly out from Ascension. So if you're wondering how on earth do you get to these remote islands uh, in the middle of the Pacific before and after your leg, both islands are served by planes now, um, and um, you can fly in and fly out. And as mentioned, we're, we're planning land tours in both of these islands. So if you want to come on a, these legs and sail between these islands, you can then stay longer and, and explore these sites if you want to with, uh, with a land tour. Ascension, I can honestly say, will blow your mind. It's a volcanic island. It's very young. It's only about a million years old, which for islands is nothing. Um, the entire island is, is a volcanic cinder cone, basically. It's got something like 12 or 14 cones on the island, but the whole thing basically is a, a lump of, of cinder and volcanic ash. Um, it, it's defined by these dramatic, spectacular red and grey cones. This is what it looked like when Darwin visited. However, there's an incredible story about um, uh, about um, well, just after the Don visited in the 1830s. About 10 years later, the British Admiralty asked them to improve the islands. So they planted thousands and thousands of trees on the tallest cone. Darwin was involved in this, but it was mainly run by Sir Joseph Hooker, who was the, the director of Kew Gardens in London. And they planted thousands and thousands of trees on the middle cone, the biggest cone in the mountain. And within a few decades, it formed the world's only artificial rainforest. You have to see this for yourself. As you've got today, it's got three layers going from dry, spiny forest to rainforest to cloud forest, right away to the summit. So well worth seeing. And of course, the island's famous for, for huge numbers of seabirds and unique birds as well, like the Central frigate bird. And one of the largest Turtle populations in the entire Atlantic, which we, we should be able to see when we get there. It's perfect time for them hatching. So you'll see hopefully both some adult turtles, but hopefully lots and lots of juveniles as well, and lots of land crabs and unique wildlife like that. Last but not, oh, sorry, the penultimate leg is from Ascension right the way up to the Azores, um, which, uh, which is a really interesting leg as, as well, heading all the way back up to the Azores and crossing the equator in the process. Um, and seeing um, as you go north, of course, you're seeing more and more dolphins, particularly common dolphins as well, and reaching the amazing uh, archipelago of the Azores, home to these spectacular volcanic cone, these volcanic um, uh, remnants of, of these ancient volcanoes. So very, very different from Ascension Island, um, but lush and green. At this point in his journey, Darwin was seriously homesick 
So he only step, really stepped ashore for a few hours. But you can pick up where Darwin didn't and explore this amazing place and enjoy the passage from Ascension right the way up across to the Azores uh, as you go. In. And of course, the waters around the Azores famous for their whales and dolphins, um, particularly to get back as well and, and migrate whales. So you'll see those. Now the very last leg of all, leg 32, from the Azores all the way back to Falmouth. And just imagine the sense of achievement being on this leg and reaching, oh, I'm so sorry, that's actually the wrong map in there. Sorry about that. <laughs> imagine the sense of achievement reaching Falmouth and, and stepping ashore, exactly how Charles Darwin did um, the best part of two centuries later. The waters in this part of the Atlantic are very famous, again, for their, their dolphins. You, you should see common dolphins, uh, several other species of cetaceans as well, um, bottlenose as well, almost certainly. It is famous for basking sharks. If you're lucky, you might see them. And you almost certainly see sunfish, mola mola, these gigantic, fish that, that eat um, that eat, eat jellyfish. Amazingly, that, that, that's the primary food. So while you're sailing north, you'll see endless amounts. Um, you should see a lot of, of interesting wildlife and things being a thin experience. And finally seeing Falmouth appear on the, the horizon and stepping ashore. And we planned um, a really wonderful event for that very evening, a bit of a party slash festival to conclude the global voyage. And of course, everyone in the voyage is invited, but especially for obvious reasons, those on leg 32, concluding this epic, epic two year global voyage. And with this slide, it concludes my four part presentations about each voyage leg. You can watch the other ones um, on the other on the recordings of the earlier question and answer sessions. I guess concluding thoughts that no matter which leg you choose, you're going to have an incredible, incredible experience. And of course, my presentations are focused mostly on the, st the start point of the end ports because that, that's where I've got photos of. But what I can't convey is those magical experiences aboard the ship, seeing those sunsets, seeing the weather, the patterns, the rhythms of life at sea. And that's, I think, the, the greatest value and treasure of this unique voyage. So, Thank you for listening to the last eight legs of, of the voyage and a hand back to Elvira any questions uh, from this point. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I have a question from Daryl uh, about the land based tours. Uh, I know he knows that you'll be speaking more about it next uh, next week or next time. Uh, but uh, will everyone who wants to participate in the four on-land programs be able to do the programs or might they sell out? No, no, it's absolutely no problem. Um, we, we, um, everyone can participate that want to. Um, if we did have too many people, because some of the legs, we have two legs adjoining. So we potentially got, got two groups, two voyage leg groups overlapping. But I mean, of course, not, not everyone's going to want to do it. But if there were to be too many, I've already got backup guides on both uh, on all, all of the legs that I'm organising, Ascension, St Helena and Falklands, that will step in and do this. So we're working on a group size of something like 10 to 12 to be manageable, especially in the Falkland Islands, where there just isn't that much accommodation in some of the remoter areas of the archipelago. Um, so don't worry, everyone that wants to take part in this will. I'm, I will, I'm volunteering as a guide. I know these places really well. So I'll be leading one group, but if there were the demand, we'll just get a different guide as well to help with, with, a, with another subgroup. So don't worry, that's definitely fine. And again, if you don't mind just waiting a little bit longer, we'll have those itineraries ready next week. And next question and answer session is entirely about these land-based tours. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Then I think a question for Gerben. It's about, uh, it's also from Daryl. He's preparing for his uh, trip already. And he's yes. asking, um, well, the big question is what kind of foul weather gear or uh, would you recommend? And if you have a price range. But, uh... um, that depends a little bit on the legs that Daryl is taking part in. Uh, do you know that? Uh, not. No. I don't, but uh, Daryl knows, and he's in here as well. Oh. <laughs> right, let me see. 
Is there a there? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm on a few legs and oh. I cross I'm on a couple that cross the equator and I'm also on I think it's leg 28 from the Falklands to South Africa. So do I need two sets of gear for the no. for the equator part and the southern ocean? Well, the, the first one to start with is, that's an easy one. Um, it is uh, relatively hot, of course, and humid uh, on these, uh, on these uh, legs uh, around the equator. And uh, it means that you have to find some gear that is uh, watertight, because if we get rain there, it is massive rain. It is sometimes that massive that uh, if you're talking together like we are now and the rain bursts, then uh, we can't see each other anymore. So it's short and massive. <laughs> So that means you need something that is uh, really watertight. On the other hand, we also used to uh, undress, uh, well, not quite completely, but quite a bit, because it was a nice uh, moment to get a shower. So sometimes the rain stops before your hair was washed out. But in your case, uh, I think you'll be quicker than I am. Um, but um, so for that, light stuff will do. Um, for the other part, if you're sa sailing from um, the Falklands to South Africa, the Southern Oceans, that is a bit more um, uh, um, um, heavy stuff. Um, so, um, but you don't need to have very expensive gear. The thing is that you need to stay uh, dry and you need to stay warm. You can achieve that by buying the most expensive gear that you that you can find. You can also have simple stuff like the fishermen wear and and wear a good uh, 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 some layers underneath it and just simple gum boots if they are big enough to 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 allow you to wear to wear uh, 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 two pairs of socks for example that's good enough so don't go for the for the price don't ju just go for the quality like it should be a bit stronger on these southern passages because you will be working a bit more in it on the other ones i mean it's like Okay, rain again. You can go down or you stay outside, and but that's that's light stuff will do. The other thing, a little bit more heavier gear uh, will do. But but I mean, just simple gear will do. Yeah. Thank Actually, uh, Daryl, uh, I forgot to mention. Um, that's a bit uh, in 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 the community pages. We have also uh, time to um, actually tell you what is for. Uh, uh, one leg or the other leg would be handy and there's also uh, perhaps um we can set something up like i mean if you have your boot your gum boots are let's say uh, size 10 then maybe somebody who was before you on board can leave them for you or you leave yours to the next group something like that so that's one of the reasons that we um, set up this uh, community page is uh, it, otherwise you're carrying around some gum boots all over the world but uh, anyway yeah. Yeah, maybe to add to that, it's always good to, to, I think, work with layers and for stuff that is outside. So maybe, but we will explain that as well in the community to make a packing list. Uh, but on the very cold legs, it might be good to have two pairs of uh, gloves or two, two hats, because if one is wet, you can put on a dry one, that kind of stuff. But, uh, and what I will do is uh, uh, put in a community on Monday uh, a few photos of, um, of the clothing that, for instance, our crew wears, that uh, that you have a bit of an idea of on uh, on what you could buy. Okay, are there any other questions? It's very quiet. <laughs> I, I have a question uh, for for Gerben. Um, I'm glad to hear that uh, I I don't have to worry about bringing my tar gear for tarring anything, but uh, what are your regulations for going aloft? Um, well, uh, first of all, we, uh, we, um, we, we try to encourage everybody to climb aloft, but of course, some people are uh, more handy or more fit or more um, trust themselves a bit more than others. So it is always under the uh, guidance of the, of the permanent crew. <clears throat> Of course, on the so they will. The first time you go aloft, they find that nice moment, a stable breeze where the ship is leaning into the rigging, where there's no uh, things like that, no no big waves, no rolling, and then we uh, we guide you up. Uh, we teach you how to wear a harness 
how to use the harness, where to hook onto, and how and where to put your hand and your feet. Um, after uh, you've done that together with a, a crew member and you feel confident, um, you can do it alone. You will still be monitored. There's always a crew member. Also, for example, if we furl a sail, there's always crew members, but they will keep an eye on you and they will give you tips and tricks. But um, uh, the longer a voyage gets, the more you get uh, into, uh, let's say, the, the, the sailor's life. So um, eventually you, you, you'll be good enough to, to do it yourself. But there's always um, the guidance of crew and always a harness. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug also um, typed something in the chat. What about live video voyage feed to the internet? Maybe you can elaborate a bit. I'm not sure if you're still there. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I was just thinking that uh, when you make a port call and you're, you have an event, will that be streamed to the internet so that the rest of the world can, can watch? Yes, absolutely. I mean, depending upon the location where we're based, we've got a combination of internet, uh, we've got a combination of sat feeds, and, and to be honest, where possible, just because of cost, we'll be we're trying, to, trying to use you know, lo local 4G and so forth where we can. But yes, we, we, ha we have got that in the works, and we are, that is precisely what we're planning. We're looking at feeds, um, particularly in the ports, um, for all the ports where, where, we, where we can, so yes. Great, great. That sounds great. I, that's, that was the big thing I was going to ask last time, but I'm glad you, you have a oh. nice answer. Thank you. Yes. We, we partnered with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. They've actually got a meeting literally next week concerning this. Um, so we're, we're trying to organize a, a, a bulk bulk sponsorship deal with a service provider specifically for this. So yes, that, that is absolutely what we're working on. Thank you. Thank you. Gerben, yeah. oh. you had someone, something to add? Yeah, well, it's a little bit off topic, but uh, actually, I am uh, investigating the 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 um, to achieve or to to uh, to to purchase uh, uh, a little um, um, well, well, let's say a router on board that is uh, working together with uh, Iridium uh, satellites. That means that um, um, e even uh, in the middle of the ocean, you could be sending small pictures or messages uh, home. It is uh, not so expensive. I, I will take a, um, 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 it's not expensive for you. It's, it's not, not that expensive for us either. The only, um, um, how you say, limit is that it is quite slow. So you can't send streaming uh, uh, video, but it is also for the, the people that are on board possible to make a selfie of yourself, Daryl up there in the mast or who was asking and uh, and send that uh, home and, uh, and, and also for other people to send you a little message. And um, I think that will, um, well, in one way, um, changes the, the, the world a little bit because one of the things that, especially on these longer voyages uh, that in the old days was um, special was of actually that once you set off, you'll be, you'll be off the grid. You're, you're, you, nobody can reach you anymore. Nobody can, it, it's something special, but it would be, I've been thinking about it. It would be silly not to use the, the means that we have nowadays uh, for that, because for some people, it may be great to be off the grid. Other people uh, would love to hear something from the, their loved ones or, or send something back home. Yes, I'm quite all right. And make sure the other ones at home are not too concerned. So I um, actually, I already ordered it months ago. And uh, the only thing we're facing is some kind of a mondial problem of, of chips and so <laughs> so I ordered it, I paid it, but I didn't uh, receive it yet. But by the time we set off, I'm I'm quite sure this this uh, um, this stuff is on board. So uh, that's that's something added to what is already done uh, by uh, by by Stu. You can do it yourself. Keep yes. your back home. Okay. And then uh, when would uh, when is the first payment due? January first or at the end of January? Is that question for me? <laughs> well, we've talked about it on Friday. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know no, the no, answer no. We, as well. We, we told everybody. <laughs> we told everybody that, of course, as as um, 
we are still working on the project and we are quite confident everything takes place and actually also today we had great great news and um so this 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 voyage is going to happen um, we sent everybody a um a pro forma a nota for uh, 500 uh, euros to just make sure that you're we're confident that you are sailing and at the end of this year we will officially um, take the decision that we will go and then we will send you an invoice obviously if you get an invoice on the first or second or third of january we don't expect you to pay that in uh, one second so there will be a normal payment um let's say a time for that so uh, but we will try to send out all these uh, invoices in the beginning the very beginning of january and I think on the invoice, it states that we ask for a uh, payment within two weeks. So um, I hope that's okay. Um, then there's a question about the rigging. Once everything is back up and running, could you uh, provide the layout at the various parts and the names, et cetera, on a community page? Because I think Yunuk, I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly, uh, she's only used to mono hulls. So uh, she needs some. Uh, more info about the three mustard schooner. Well, this is a mono hull too. Uh, <laughs> well, now there was a hole in it, but it's still one hole. Um, but I understand what you mean, uh, and there is some information. Um, um, let's Elvira help me think. Yeah. We had this booklet. We have, I don't the, know if it's finished we have the booklet. Yet. We and do. Think, huh? Yeah, we have a booklet with a lot of information. Uh, uh, the idea is that you will that. It will be on board as well, but we can also share it in the community. Um, yeah. The thing is that I think we had to do a last check on the on the pinwheel diagram, if it's OK. So uh, we will be working on that and uh, placing or putting it in the community. Yeah. And meanwhile, you can already uh, download a picture of the rigging uh in the on our website and you can see how all the lines and the sails and the masts and spars are uh, fitted on the ship it's it's an official drawing of the rigging so but it doesn't give you any all the names and all the pins of course but we will work on that booklet and uh we'll we'll uh, make sure you get it uh, uh um we'll get it ready this year uh Alfira, huh? if i look at we will. you yes okay, good. <laughs> Okay, anyone else with a good question or a bad one? Never a bad question. No? Well then. I, I actually have another one for, for Stuart this time. Um, when are you gonna be putting, when are the applications gonna be coming out for um, mentors? For the mentors, there is already a registration process on the site. Um, you, can, you can sign up for information concerning it. Um, we're mm -hmm. actually launching the new site, I believe, on Thursday this week. Um, so we, we have got some information on the mentors that, that's coming live on that uh, on that week, uh, on, on Thursday as well. But yeah, if you can just register on the site, um, we've got a package that we'll then send out to you. Um, and um, you can also click at the bottom and there's a page concerning it as well. Um, so yeah, you, you can you can register now if you want to. If you're interested okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't missed anything. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions at all? No. No? Well, okay. Then I would say have a lovely Saturday evening if it's everyone's evening already, I'm not sure. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it's daylight, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. We hope to see you all again uh, on the 1st of November. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, everyone, for coming and taking part. And it's great to meet, her, meet you all. So thank you so, so much. Bye. Thank you for your uh, time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.